Peg gave me the great quote of saying, humor makes heard things bearable, is appreciated by other people, and is just plain fun. Peg grew up in many places, Bethesda, Winnextica, DC, and Manhattan. She, as a growing up in the different places, she claimed she was a tomboy, and she loved climbing trees and playing softball. She started playing the guitar at age 15. She said after she met one of the younger siblings of Pete Seeger at a high school square dance. She went on to study, and she uh, uh, graduated from Smith, where she studied social work. She worked some as a secretary, and then went on for many years in her work in social work. She has also taught guitar in the years of raising her children, played softball a little more on the side, done some kayaking, some fast walking, raised her family in Sudbury. Sometimes, now, she, these days, she performs music with her singer-songwriter son in New York City. And she also has a daughter who works on documentary films. Only in the last seven years, uh, in her 60s, did she start songwriting. And Peg claims once she started songwriting, one song led to another and to another. And before you know it, two CDs were recorded. So hopefully there are some here today. One of her songs placed her third in the Boston Folk Festival songwriting contest. And when I asked for a few stories about favorite memories of sharing her songs, Peg stated a woman rabbi from a Jewish renewal synagogue in New York City heard my song, Living Will, Living, Living Well. Living Will, Lev Living Well, and found it so inspirational she sang it to her whole congregation at Yom Kippur services. Peg has stated that sharing my songs has been a total hoot. It's given great new friends, tremendous ego boost, sense of progress and learning and validation of some of my innermost crazy thoughts and behaviors. I am not alone. <laughs> so here to share some of her crazy and perhaps not so crazy thoughts and behaviors, uh, some songs that, that might be of humor and might be of more serious. Very much look forward to welcoming up here Peg Espinola. I decided uh, there was two kinds of, well, there are two extremes of humor. One is biting sarcasm, acrid, you know, uh, scathing wit, that sort of thing. I don't do a whole lot of that. And the other is um, uh, gentle humor, and I think I do more of that. <clears throat> so I decided I'd start with um, a song about the gentlest person in my life, my uh, grandson Sam. And this was actually written when he was two. Uh, if you don't have to care for a toddler, if you don't take care of them, they can be a lot of fun just to watch. <clears throat> so this is called Calypso Sam. <clears throat> you want and you do what you can it's amazing to see everything you can do it's amazing to think that you're not quite too <clears throat> you climb on a chair then you climb on the table you climb to the ceiling if you were able you climb to the very top of the couch you fall on your face and we all say ouch sam sam little man you know what you want and you do what you can It's amazing to see everything you can do It's amazing to think that you're not quite too You open a drawer and you pull out a pot A lid and a ladle, now what have you got? You got a one-man band, makes a joyful noise With a band like that you don't need no toys Sam, Sam, little man you know what you want and you do what you can It's amazing to see everything you can do It's amazing to think that you're not quite too You grab mommy's broom and you sweep the floor You grab Max's book bag, you're out the door You want to drive like your daddy Joe You grab the wheel and you won't let go Sam, Sam, little man You know what you want and you 
you do what you can. It's amazing to see everything you can do. It's amazing to think that you're not quite too. night and it's time to stop you'd play and you'd play till your parents drop but no matter how hard you cry and fight you're still gonna hear that last good night sam sam little man you know what you want and you do what you can it's amazing to see everything you can do it's amazing to know how much i love you So that's the gentle emotion of loving humor. And then you have the, uh, the kind of thing that comes when you, when you wake up in the, at 3 in the morning and you can't get back to sleep and you're full of, you're, you're churning. Uh, you're full of worry and you're full of hostility and anger and all kinds. So the only thing to do is get up and write a song. <clears throat> and this one, um, I've called this the most hostile song I've ever written, and I actually described it that way to my children, who are the, um, the objects of this song. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Toys in the Attic. I've lived in my house since the late 1960s. The children grew up and they went separate ways. The carpets are worn and the furniture's musty. Like me and my friends, they have seen better days. I'm ready to downsize and move to a condo with a pool and a clubhouse and singles galore. But first I must deal with my surplus possessions, the things that the children insist that I store. There are toys in the attics and tools in the cellar. There are books in the closets and bikes in the shed. The kids will, the children won't take them, but they say I must keep them. I fear I am going to go out of my head. I found a solution, I'll take all the silver, some photos I cherish and steal out of town. There's a fellow named Harry, they call him the torch, and while I am away, he will burn the house down. <laughs> I met up with Harry and gave him some money. I promised the rest when the deed was done. But the coppers got wind of our evil intent, and now Harry and I are a band on the run. <laughs> so all you grown children, pay heed to my story. Take your papers and tchotchkes while there is still time. Don't pressure your parents till they come to their wits, and don't drive your dear mother to traffic in crime. <laughs> There were toys in the attic and tools in the cellar. There were books in the closets and bikes in the shed. The kids wouldn't take them, but they said I must keep them. Your honor, I simply went out of my head. <laughs> mm. So you know what I'm up against? Um, my son said upon hearing this song, well, the more hostile thing would have been to throw the stuff out. <laughs> In fact, you know, it's beginning to go slowly. <laughs> so here's another song which was again churning at three in the morning. Uh, back in 2006, when I had no reason to be worrying this way. 2008, another story. It's called Rumination. <clears throat> Do I have enough to retire? Enough to keep the wolf from the door? Can I call it quits at the office? Or should I work a little bit more? I've got some money stashed in an IRA. Fidelity and Vanguard too. Should I keep my hands off it till I'm older? What's a person supposed to do? I don't want to get a job at Walmart. Wish everyone a very nice day. Could I just reduce my hours and still get decent pay? Uncle Sam cuts me a paycheck. It really doesn't go that far. It would only be enough to live on if I didn't need a house or car. I'd rather have a little bit extra. Don't want to be on the skids. I'd 
like to leave some money to my children and some to my two grandkids. Should I sell my house in the suburbs, move into a trailer park, shack up with another old codger? I am really in the dark. Will there be enough for the movies, or will I have to watch each cent? I don't want to be a burden in my retirement. So many possibilities out there, better ways to spend my time. But life could really be quite dreary if I didn't have a nickel or a dime. Would I want to go to Foxwoods with other ladies on a bus? Put quarters in the slots for hours. Is that a life for folks like us? I'd rather go to Acapulco, snorkel in the ocean blue. Guess I better keep my day job for another year or two. I actually like my day job. I'm in social work and private practice, and I do so work, but with reduced hours. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so I'm going to change the, the subject. Those, those last two songs were part of my geriatric trilogy. Um, I'm not going <laughs> to. The third one's called Falling Apart, and um, I discovered, I hadn't sung it for a while, that I used to be able to get through all the verses on one breath, and now I can't. So I just I decided it's too hard, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to go to. Um, one of the indignities of later life, if you should want to date when you are past 60, it's not always such an easy thing. And I, I was widowed actually at 49, and so I did quite a bit of dating, about 15 years worth before I had this, what I call the last bad date. And some of it was, was very good, and I had met some nice people and had nice some relationships that just didn't go anywhere long, you know. but. Uh, you know, good time was had by all. Uh, in, in this case, this, this last date took place in 2001 on uh, Labor Day weekend. Well, you know what came after that? 9-11 came after that. So that sort of caused a reordering of priorities, I think, among many people, um, including myself. So anyway, I should say, we're introducing this song, that despite my name, Espinola, I am Jewish ethnically, and um, that's just to make the context of the song so you don't get the wrong idea about it <clears throat> or about me. I saw his ad on the personals page. He was single and a Jew. A doctor, he was just my age. It was too good to be true. I rang the paper, left my number, waited for his call. In a couple of days, we'd made a date. It took no time at all. And in the intervening hours until the weekend came, my future, future, it seemed rosy bright, though I did not know his name. <clears throat> we met at Pete's in Newton Center. It was close to him. He was seated with a glass of water filled up to the brim. His shirt was open, thick full chain had shown upon his chest. I smiled bravely and determined I would do, do my best. For Jewish doctors, after all, don't grow on every tree. I placed my order, he stayed put while I paid for my tea. <clears throat> He talked about his job, his kids, his ex, and his divorce. He'd lost the kids to gain his freedom and the house, of course. Now he could perfect his tennis workout at the gym. By the time he'd finished, I had heard enough of him. <laughs> But he was first to leave the table and be on his way. And I, I was left to sip my tea and mourn a wasted day. <clears throat> this date was but a variation on a single theme. 
of disappointed expectations men not what they seem so do i go with it at first and try and try again or would it be okay for me to simply pack it in give up the search for someone special would it be so wrong in friend and family find enough to sing a joyful song My tale has ended, I can tell you, I gave up the chase. Immersed myself in work and play, met many a friendly face. I give myself to worthy causes, nurture kids and plants, and only rarely miss the music of that ancient dance. But if someday I happen on a man both kind and true, well, I might deign to take his hand. And join the dance anew. <laughs> I should say that some of these songs I haven't played in a while, <laughs> so I'm a little difficulty with the playing of them, even though I rehearsed. All right, so actually, segue to that song. Um, the way that's interesting I sang it much lower than I usually do it seemed to work out this song is actually the title track on my second CD um, it's called Living Will Living Well which uh, Cheryl mentioned somehow oh yeah that was the one that the rabbi picked up on I, I still say I can't imagine this being sung at Yom Kippur but what do I know um and this song was written in 2008, just before the election, and uh, it's really a song of, of triumph in some ways. Lots of nice things were happening back then to me, exciting, and, um, and uh, there is humor in it, although I don't consider it a funny song by any matter of means. Um, and I dedicate it to my late boyfriend, Dave, who I had two very lovely years with, which started and started in uh, that year. What is the matter with me here? <clears throat> I'm of an age when I ought to be mulling which life-saving treatments I'd rather forego. I should be placing my photos and albums with everyone labeled so people will know. That man at the Watergate party came dressed as a plumber, and which was his wife? Now is the time to be wrapping things up, and instead I keep stumbling back into life. Now that my hair has grown gray, shouldn't I call it a day? Given the cards that I hold, High time to fold. Just as I finally could file all my papers, reorder my closets, and thin out the flowers. Just as it seemed I could tackle the Odyssey, reread old classics for hours and hours. That's when my eyes spied a lovely green bicycle whispering, please take me out for a spin. Soon it was mine and I teetered and tottered and then I was flying as fast as the wind. Now that my hair has turned gray, shouldn't I call it a day? But look at this new card I hold, guess I'm not ready to fold. avoiding political action caught up in the rituals of everyday life deploring the mess they had made down in Washington loss of our liberties misguided strife then I encountered some bold senior citizens carrying banners and working for change 
buoyed by their courage, I picked up a banner, and suddenly hope seemed no longer so strange. Now that our hair has turned gray, shouldn't we just fade away? But look at these signs that we hold. We are not ready to fold. Solitaire crossword Sudoku. I found a new hobby and burst into song. Made musical peace with the death of my husband and settled old scores with some love's done me wrong. Told the whole world I'd stop looking for romance, was satisfied simply to sit in the sun. Never expecting a new love would parachute into my life with a promise of fun. Now that our hair has turned gray, we have the leisure to play. I look at this hand that I hold, we are not ready to I still do feel that way. <laughs> okay, um, so I think this is, I think, I don't know how my time's doing, but this is planned to be my last one. Uh, now this song uh, relates to a period in my life when I felt extremely awkward and like I didn't fit in and uh, just just not great. And it's a, a period where many people feel that way, which is around 12, 13. I mean, there are some people who are living, you know, living large at that age, but I don't know who they are. Anyway, <clears throat> and I, I was living, by the way, in Winnetka, Illinois, which is a very white bread community, very wealthy, and we weren't. Dad was out of work, and um, again, and um, so that was part of my malaise, but certainly not all of it or most of it. <clears throat> It's called Once I Wished I Was a Blonde. <laughs> Once I wished I was a blonde with a cheerleader smile and a boyfriend oh so fond who would tarry a while. Once I wished I was a blonde. Once I hated being tall, twasn't fair, twas a sin that the boy across the hall only came to my chin. Once I hated being tall. Mother said, divide my time, watch your hurry, where's the race? Flying solo is no crime, older men will love your face. <laughs> but how could she understand? She who never looked like me. She was only five foot three. Once I wanted to be cute with a pert little nose and a dad with lots of loot. Couldn't help, help hurt, I suppose, once I wanted to be cute. Once I hated being smart, boys don't like brainy girls. Best to be a dunce with heart and some natural curls. Once I hated being smart. Mother said, divide my time. Watch your hurry, where's the race? Flying solo is no crime. Older men will love your face. But how could she understand? She who never looked like me. Eyes are blue and five foot three. Well, I never was a blonde, though it's easy to do. <laughs> but of gentlemen so fond, there are more than a few. Though I never was a blonde, you don't have to be a blonde. <laughs> Thank you. Canoeing in February on the Rappahannock. Tom was a little uptight. He wanted all details just right. So our trip down the stream was his negative dream that probably still keeps him at night. My yellow canoe, it was old, but it had adventured often and bold. Tom's craft, it was new, a bright red canoe. Twas an old town on which he'd been sold. The rocks flexed my plastic about causing cracks through which water did spout. 
flooding floor of the boat, causing Tom then to note, to the shore, quick, you've got to get out. So goodbye to my boat, I did moan. Tom's canoe carried us on, alone, till a large rock was spied. We disagreed on which side, <laughs> and the canoe shaped a U round that stone. <laughs> New plastic magic showed clear. The boat popped back straight to our cheer. We reloaded and paddled, movements no longer addled, till the farmer's field did appear. Electric wire at last second I spied, caught it, passed it, Tom caught it in stride. But when he stood to a cost about the wire that crossed by next wire, from the boat, he was pride. Tom hit the stream with a splash. From the water, he quickly did dash. Spare clothes he did don, while I took the wire on. So Fen's shock caused my teeth then to gnash. That ended the action that day. We drifted downstream peacefully, and the adversity just might have made Tom less uptight. And aren't we all so much better that way? <laughs> Thank you. Snowflakes. Soon they will be coming down, covering the ground. We think they are so perfect, but sure enough, they fade away. Their perfection fades. Thanks. <laughs> Jasmine, rosemary, 